So just to, for those of you that are new to the, uh, the Cafe Sci format, what's going to happen is we're going to have a talk from uh, this week, Josh Arbon, who I'll introduce in a minute. And then after that, um, we will be um, having a QA. and a The Q&A sometimes goes on until around seven o'clock. Sometimes we wrap up, up earlier, it just kind of depends on whenever we finish. But seven o'clock is our kind of cutoff time there. And um, you can feel free to post um, your questions in the chat box if you move your um, mouse down to the towards the bottom of your screen, or it should be the same, some sort of film, similar layout on your phone. There's a variety of buttons you can push there, and one of them is um, the chat function that will bring up the chat where you can um, ask questions. Equally, if you want to ask a question afterwards, after the talk, and you want to turn the camera on and ask it, that way, just, just post saying that you've got a question you'd like to ask and we'll do it that way. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, on with the talk. So today, yeah, we as I've mentioned, we have Josh Arvin. Josh is doing a um, PhD at the moment with the Cornish Jackdaw Group, which we'll be hearing more about in a second and also if you were here for the keg of knowledge event that happened uh, a couple of months ago now it's part of darwin week uh josh was the host for that so that's why some of you might be thinking i've seen that face before um so yeah uh without further ado over to you josh cheers ben um i will just get my presentation up hope everyone can hear me okay so I was having a slight bit of trouble with my internet earlier, which is uncharacteristic, but hopefully all will be well. Um, are the screens the right way around, Ben? Are you seeing the, the yes, right? Yes, they are. Yeah, that's all looking good. Cracking. Well, let me pull out my laser pointer and we'll begin. So yeah, welcome everyone. Um, as Ben said, uh, my name is Josh and I'm a PhD student at the University of Exeter, part of the Centre for Ecology and Conservation um, up at Tremo campus. And today I'm going to talk to you a bit about the work I've done um, in my PhD and a bit of broader work that my research group has done on jackdaws um, and how jackdaws use each other to learn. Um, but first I'd really like to just thank you all for coming um, and thank the Cornwall Science community for inviting me um, they put on really, really great events and have been really helpful with us with our events in the past. So it's really nice to be able to, to do one of these events uh, myself. Uh, so thank you all and thanks Ben for, for the invitation. So I'm going to really try and address uh, two main questions this evening. Um, and they might seem a bit wacky and they might seem a bit unlinked, but hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll believe me in the sense that they're both interesting and both uh, have some sort of shared theme. So the first one is how can eating cheese in Cornwall save a species in Hawaii? And then after that, I will move on to talk thinking about uh, what can remote control bird feeders tell us about intelligence. But first, I think I'm going to give you a bit of a preamble and introduce you to my study species, the jackdaw. So I work on jackdaws and jackdaws are a member of the corvids or the crow family. Um, and if you look at the bottom of the image here, you have many of the corvids that you're likely to see in the UK. More generally, there are others, but these are some of the main contenders. So from left to right, we have the biggest of all, the raven. And then we have rooks and crows, my species, the jackdaw, and then a magpie. And so if you look at a jackdaw, if, you've, if you aren't confident in identifying a jackdaw out in the wild, they are about half the size of a crow, like someone shrunk them in the wash a little bit. And they have these lovely silver sort of napes on the back of their head and a really, really bright eye. So if you see a big black bird or medium black bird, and you can see the eye really clearly and it's bright white or light blue, then that's going to be a jackdaw. Um, they all look, I think, I think, I like to think they look a bit more kind looking than a crow or a rook, and they also make a bit more of a kind noise. So as a crow or a rook sort of makes that sort of classic, Kah! that really harsh sound that we, we kind of come to know, jackdaws kind of just chatter away to each other a lot. So you'll hear them going, chick, 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 chick. Um, and that's the bit where I embarrass myself over. Um, but they make, I think, just a, a far more pleasant noise. Um, and jackdaws, I think, are really, really interesting because they are not only are they just really cool birds in themselves, but they are really highly social. So they live in um, aggregations, loose groups um, of a few individuals up to in the winter, they'll flock in their hundreds and if not thousands to their winter roosts. Um, they form long term monogamous pair bonds, so they will mate for life. Um, and unlike things like you know, seabirds and albatrosses that we think of as mating for life that might come back together to breed, Jackdaws will be with their partner for the entire year. So if you ever see jackdaws out and about, you're likely to see, a, if you see, have a land, you'll probably see the other. Or if you see them flying over the top and if you can get a count of them, it's likely to be an even number. They basically are attached at the hip. Um, and jackdaws are really, really successful in urban environments. 
Um, so you will be able to see them nesting in, in chimney stacks, in roofs, in walls, in barns, in lofts, anywhere they can get themselves a nice little cavity. Um, and there's a really, really uh, common roost in the trees outside Weatherspoon's pub in the middle of Falmouth. So if you're ever walking through Falmouth at a, an, um, at a student kind of an hour, you'll hear them chatting away together in the trees there. Um, and this success in urban environments is, is really interesting because lots of species aren't able to do that. So we live in an ever, as we are all probably too well aware, an ever changing world and a world in which human um, influences are really harming lots of wildlife. And if you think of a, the house sparrow, another animal that you would associate with, with living in human, in human environments, um, since the 1980s, their populations have dropped by about two thirds. Whereas in contrast, the jackdaws have increased by about two thirds. And hopefully by the end of the talk, I think you might get a bit of an appreciation in, in how they've been able to buck this trend, as it were. So I work as part of the Cornish Jackdaw Project, uh, and we're a research project that's been going for about eight or nine years now. Um, and we study cognition in the wild. And when I say cognition, I mean um, how animals sort of take in information and process information about their environment. So we are based at the University of Exeter and we have um, study sites throughout Cornwall. Our main study sites are in the village of Stithians, in the churchyard and farm yet farmland around there. But we also have sites at Penryn campus. Um, we've recently started sites at Ennis Garden, one in Morgan on the Lizard, and there's a site over by Constantine. So we um, provide the jackdaws with these nest boxes so we can monitor their nesting and their breeding attempts. And every single bird that we catch gets a unique combination of colorings on its legs. So here you can see this bird is silver, metal, white, blue. And that allows us to identify each of the birds individually and we can uh, monitor them from cradle to grave as it were. So we can, there are lots of birds that we've, we've had for the whole entirety of their lives in the project. So we get this kind of really fine scale uh, monitoring of a really large wild population of now over 2000 birds that we've ringed in across the project. Uh, just to give you a bit of broader scope on some of the things the project is interesting in looking at. So this is one of our nest boxes and one of our PhD students, Becky, has just is finishing up her PhD now, has been spending the last few years uh, investigating the pair bond between mated pairs of birds. Um, very lovely. And uh, she's been looking at how pair bonds, you know, how, how bonded individuals are, and it varies throughout the population, affects anything from how they breed together to how they console each other after they've been put through a stressful event. So you get the really kind of fine scale behavioral patterns, but we also research all the way up to the large scale sort of population level phenomena. So this is a, uh, an overlaid image of a group of jackdaws going to a winter roost. So each one of these lines is thousands of images of a bird laid on top of each other. So you can see here, there's a pair flying together over here and using multiple arrays of many different cameras and some really clever scientists at Stanford that we that do some black magic with, with video that we don't really, uh, don't really touch. We've been able to look at the properties of how big groups move in the same way that starlings murmurate, jackdaws also perform these massive display flights of hundreds of birds. And we've been able to, uh, to look at how they all interact on their way to the winter roosts. So from really from the really fine scale up to the really large stuff. But my work is focused on information and learning. And so what I'm going to talk to you about for the majority and the rest of this talk is information and learning. And to use an example of um, where information is, is really important, I'm going to think about urban environments and, and human based environments. So if you're a jackdaw or any bird, really, and you're coming into an environment for the first time, there are lots of new things that you need to learn about things that could possibly be life or death, right? So there'll be people who might not be inclined to be friendly towards you and might try and harm you. There'll be uh, things you've never encountered before like vehicles, which are very, um, very dangerous. You'll come across lots of substances, some of which might be good food sources, but others of which might be poisonous and might be really dangerous for you to interact with. You'll come across novel predators, things like uh, pets that you may never have actually come across, but might try and eat you. And lots of things that you might not be able to see or perceive or have no real, um, comparison in the wild such as you know electricity wires transformers all those sorts of things so you have to learn about all these things but these things are all very dangerous and they're very very and if you interact with them directly they're a very good way to get hurt um, and jackdaws in particular have uh, a characteristic which really helps them in that regard and that's called neophobia um, and neophobia just basically means they're really really scared of anything that's new and, and this is no exaggeration. They absolutely hate anything. They hate change. Anything that's new is terrifying to them. Um, and as a bit of a, an example, we have these feeding tables out at our study site and we bring them, you know, we use them to, to lay them with worms or whatever for, for 
wants to bring them in. They know they exist. They're really happy to come to them. But if you just pick up a random stick off the floor, any stick, it's not particularly special, and plonk it in the middle of that table, all of a sudden the birds are, whoa, hang on. That wasn't there before. That's, that's new. That's changed. Don't like that. And they'll two, three days before they'll try and eat from that table again. And it just really goes to show that they are absolutely terrified of anything that they don't aren't quite familiar with, um, which is a great strategy for avoiding dangerous things. But when dangerous things are everywhere and you have to constantly interact with them, you, you can't just avoid them forever. So, so you have to find a way to be able to learn about them without actually having to interact them, interact with them yourself. And that is where social learning comes in. And social learning is just a fancy way of saying learning from others. At a time an animal learns something by watching another animal or interacting with the products of another animal. Um, and an example I will give you is, imagine this bird has just uh, moved into an area with a predator it doesn't know. So it doesn't know how to react to this predator and it has two options. It can use what we would call sort of asocial or trial and error learning and just go and investigate it itself. But that's usually a pretty good way to end up as lunch. And that's not great. So instead, the other option is that that bird could use social learning and by observing an individual that already knows the correct response and is already knowledgeable about that predator, it can learn the correct response without actually having to take the risk itself, right? So then when it comes to facing that individual for the first time, it already knows what the correct response is and can avoid being said lunch. Um, but social learning isn't restricted to these sorts of scenarios. Social learning is, is, is widespread and there's pretty much no limit on what animals can learn from each other. Um, and that really brings me on quite nicely to the first big question of the evening. How can eating cheese in Cornwall save a species in Hawaii? So cheese. Jackdaws love cheese. Um, it is high in fat. Um, they've, they've, I think due to having lived in urban environments for quite a long time, they've become quite familiar with cheese from, from a bit of a bin raid every now and again, and people put throwing it out into their garden for them. Um, so we use cheese as a reward in certain experiments because the birds really go crazy for it. Um, and but cheese can be really useful. And so Alison Greger, who's here in the bottom right, a former PhD student of the project, wanted to know whether jackdaws could learn using social learning from each other about new foods. And so what she did is she took some cheese, nice yellow cheese, they love that, know that, and she added blue food dye. All of a sudden, that becomes a new food. And you can imagine that uh, any new food has the potential to be really good, but it also has the potential to be really dangerous. You know, one mistake in, you know, you could eat something that's toxic and that could be it for you. So she wanted to look at whether birds could learn from each other about blue cheese. So she dyed some cheese blue and left it out. And, and, and at first, the birds are completely against it. They don't want anything to do with it. But over time, the boldest of the bold decides it's worth taking the risk. And so one bird goes and eats some blue cheese. And from then on, um, lots of birds were witnessing this. And birds were far, far more likely to go and eat that cheese themselves once they'd seen another individual do it and see that it is therefore safe to eat. So this kind of showed that birds could learn from each other through social learning about new foods. Um, and last year, I took this experiment one stage further and used um, the, created an experiment where I ran um, four different new food types. So these were all cheeses, believe it or not, but dyed different colors. So we had red cheese, blue cheese, green cheese, and gray cheese. It was quite the smorgasbord. Um, and we had these little arenas, which are basically plastic boxes up into trees or on the sides of barns and presented um, birds with cheese in these little trays and basically witnessed who eats which cheese and who sees who eat which cheese. So we kind of put these cameras out and we film the birds and see who eats what and who watches what. And we can basically map the spread of cheese eating of all these new cheeses through the population. Um, and the reason I wanted to do this is because not all individuals are the same. Individuals have social relationships. Individuals are different in, in age. They're different in aggression. They're different in many, many ways. And there are definitely ways in which those characteristics can cause information to move faster or slower through a population. So, for instance, the classic theory in, in, in this sort of area says that adult birds are going to be better than juveniles. Adult birds have knowledge. Therefore, you should learn from them, whereas juveniles are idiots. They are young. They have no knowledge. You should ignore what they're doing. And so we wanted to look at these sorts of effects in our population of birds. And so this uses what we call social networks. So social networks are basically like exactly the same in birds as they are in humans. You can imagine it like the Facebook or Twitter of birds. Um, and what we have here is a network of birds. So every one of these circles represents a bird. And the lines that will appear between them will represent a time when a, one bird watches another bird eat a new colour of cheese. 
in this instance it's the green sheet so here we have a green which is the first bird that came and took the plunge and it's the one that knows about green cheese and i'm going to play this video and hopefully if it's not too jittery you should see the behavior kind of spread throughout the population over time as individuals observe others eating the cheese the behavior then just spreads throughout the population to the point where everyone in the population knows that there is green cheese and that green cheese is safe to eat so what did we find out by doing this? What, what was the point from a scientific standpoint? So we found out two things about social learning. We found out that there was both what I'd call specific social learning. So imagine if I were to witness someone else eat blue, I would then be more likely to go and eat blue myself. But we also found that the birds can generalize that knowledge. So if I were to witness someone eat blue, I would also be more likely to go and eat red. So there definitely seems to be a property where the birds see, you know, oh, this is a new food I don't know in this context near a food that I do know, that's probably safe to eat too. And this kind of generalization of behavior is probably something that helps them to link similar challenges in their natural environment. Um, we also found that adults are more influential than, than juveniles, as we'd have expected in terms of learning. While some individuals still did learn from juveniles, the majority of learning was from adults because as you would expect, they have better information, they are more knowledgeable. You know, they've done it right. They've managed to survive to adulthood and therefore you should probably do what they do. We were also able to find about, about who were better learners. So it turns out that more aggressive birds, birds that were attack other birds more readily, were also actually faster at learning about these new things from others. So there may be an effect that if you are attacking other birds, you're having to pay attention to them. And therefore, aggression in this act instance actually does pay off. Um, and also that juveniles, because probably they don't have as much information, they are more naive, they learn faster than adults because they are more eager to learn in that regard. Um, so social learning, I think, accounted for about 75% of all of the learning in our population. But about a quarter of the birds learn on their own by kind of eschewing what we thought about social learning and actually thinking, you know what, well, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I've not seen anyone do this, but I'm going to do it. Um, and again, we found that aggressive birds were more likely to do that too. So there definitely is a link between being aggressive and, and taking more risks. Um, but we also found that adults are faster, at are more likely to, to go it alone than juveniles. And again, that kind of makes sense if you think that, you know, adults have got to where they are, um, they're already quite knowledgeable and therefore they're probably better placed to work out where their next risk should be taken. But Josh, you say, what does this tell me about Hawaii? You promised me Hawaii. And so allow me to tell you how all this strange related cheese talk relates to Hawaii. Um, so back to Alison Greger, who did the original cheese experiment. And this, let me introduce the Hawaiian crow or the alala, as it is in the native language. And the Hawaiian crow is quite like our crows, but they use tools to extract um, insects. And they are also critically endangered to the point where, as of three or four years ago, they were extinct in the wild and the entire population was held in about four aviaries. Um, and there'd be many, many reintroductions and many attempts to bring them back into the wild. But every time they'd release them, they'd get eaten by predators or they'd eat things and die. And so when Alison Greger finished her PhD, she moved to the San Diego Zoo and to the reintroduction project of this Hawaiian crow and took what she learned about how jackdaws learn about eating cheese and applied it to this problem and thought, well, maybe there's things that they don't know. Maybe there's things that they need to learn. And it turns out that the crows were, were because there were no other natural knowledgeable crows, no, no viable population, the individuals weren't learning what the bad predators were and they weren't learning what the good foods were. And so by implementing a teaching program to train the birds before they were released, they were able to reintroduce the species and two years ago was the first natural uh, Hawaiian crow nesting attempt and successful breeding attempt in decades on the island. So, and the, and the outcome is now looking good for this species. Um, and lots of the time when I talk about my research to people, they say, oh yeah, that's really interesting, but, but why? You know, why do I care about some silly birds eating some silly colored cheeses in a box in Cornwall? And, and I understand that it's not directly applied conservation, but by studying the fundamentals of behavior and the fundamental processes that underlie how the natural world works, we're in such a better position to be able to apply conservation practice. And I think this is just a really good highlighting point. And, and I, hope, I hope you will agree that there is, a, there is still a lot of value in what we call sort of blue sky science, you know, science just for the sake of science, because it's interesting and because it tells us the basics of how everything works. Um, so with that, that is the end of part one. And I will now move on to what remote control bird feeders can tell us about intelligence. So 
take a breather and we're back. So in order to do that, we now move on to social intelligence. And this is one of my favorite quotes and may not have the impact with you, but I'm gonna tell it to you anyway. So it says, the social domain is arguably the most complex and fluctuating component of an animal's environment. And when you think about that, you can you can probably think about that too in terms of people, right? If you think about how complex your life is in terms of when you're going to work and all these things, we kind of get into our routines and they're very fixed and, and things are often quite predictable. But our social lives, they can be hectic. There are people here, there and everywhere doing this, that and the other. And you're trying to keep up with who knows who and who's arranged this with who. There's a lot to keep track of. And animals are no real, no real, really no different. Um, and so there's a very, very fundamental and quite... Um, important theory called the social intelligence hypothesis which basically says animals that have more complex more difficult social lives there's more to take track of that there's a lot going on and therefore they should have bigger brains to be able to deal with that you know there's more information and more individuals doing different things you may have to know who am i cooperating with are they reliable or are they going to cheat who um when I'm fighting with another individual, do I back down or do I escalate this conflict? Is it worth it? You know, who do I learn from? Are they, are they knowledgeable? Are they reliable? Or do I build a relationship with this individual? All these things you kind of have to keep track of and should generate these challenges that would necessitate needing big brains. And as the corvids are always renowned as one of the smartest end of, of, the, of, the, of the animals and definitely of the birds, uh, we thought we'd put them to a bit of a mental test in terms of their social, social networks. So what we wanted to know was whether they could learn which individuals would benefit them and which individuals wouldn't. So what we did is we used some remote controlled bird feeders. Um, and we need to use remote controlled bird feeders, sadly, because jackdaws are really, really wary of people um, in the UK, especially, and especially of us, because we are the people who go up and climb up to their nests and weigh their chicks. And so they give us the especially harsh treatment. So what we have to do is we have to run experiments where we can go and set it up, get a computer to run it all and we go and hide in our cars and then come back a few hours later and, and, and say thank you very much. Um, so what we did is we took two bird feeders and we paired them together with a, with a computer here. And each of those two feeders had little doors operated by little motors, which had two different types of food in. So there was either mealworms, which is like a high quality food, jackdaws love mealworms, or there was grain. And grain is fine, they'll happily eat grain, but it's kind of so-so. And we took two of these feeders and we linked them together. Now, earlier I told you that each of the birds has a unique combination of colorings on its legs. Well, we're even sneakier than that because you see one of those colorings has a little thing implanted in it, which is a radio frequency ID chip. The same sort of thing you chip your, your domestic cat or dog pet with. It, so you, it has a identifier in it. And that means we can put little antennae on these perches and the, the computer can see which bird is here and based on who it's with can justify whether it gets good food or whether it gets no food. So we took our population of birds and we split them in two and said half of you are A's and half of you are B's. And when you come to the feeder, if an A comes with an A, great, that's a success. Within your same group, you get high quality food. A B comes with a B. Again, success, high quality food. The doors open, jackdaws get mealworms, everybody's happy. However, if an A comes with a B or a B comes with an A, that's a failure. Across the group is a failure and all of those doors will shut and the birds get locked out of the feeders and everyone's very unhappy. And we wanted to know, are the birds able to work out who's in their group and can they act on that information to generate good outcomes for themselves? Basically, can they get themselves more mealworms by working out who's good and who isn't? So this is what it looked like. Uh, here's a video of a bird on its own. And when they're on their own, they just get to eat the grain, no high quality food. So here's a bird just on its own eating some grain um, and this ring at the back is the one with the little tag in it that's being read by the antennae. So here this is an example of a failure so what you'll see is that these birds is currently eating grain here but when the second bird arrives there are cross groups it's a failure the computer reads them and it will shut all of the doors so this door is birds are left frustrated checking at the doors and where the high quality door opens uh, here sorry and the bird now immediately switches and starts eating mealworms because mealworms are fantastic so what did we find i'm going to talk you through this graph so please don't be alarmed there's a lot on it but i bet you can all i reckon you can all grasp it fine so if you look along the bottom here we just have the number of days along the experiments this is just time and each of these little gray bars is the number of times that two birds were on the feeder at once in a day. So the number of times there was either uh, 
a success or a failure and that's just you know basically counting how much activity there was now in the red little is the number of failures there were okay, so the amount of times a bird an a came with a b or a b came with an a failures and then the blue line is the successes so when a's came together or when b's came together and all the black line is is the difference between that summed up over time so as you can see as time goes along there are actually more failures than successes. The birds haven't really got to grips with it yet. They don't really know what's going on and they're getting locked out of the feeder more than they're getting high quality food. But over the course of the experiment, after about a month, after a few hundred visits across all the birds, they start to work out what's going on. They remember who's good and who's not. And the tide starts to turn and successes outrun failures. And you can see here, the blue is constantly above the red and the successes go all the way up and up and up to 400, up to about 400 per day. So what did that show us? It showed us that birds were able to learn who benefited them. The jackdaws were able to solve the problem and really impact their own, um, their own rewards. They got lots more mealworms and they were all very happy, I can assure you. Um, but that showed us that they also could tell who, who each other were because all these groups, you know, A's and B's, it doesn't really mean anything. It, it, doesn't, it has no biological meaning. We very much did it on a computer and random, did press random and assign them arbitrarily there was no way they could have known who was in their group without interacting and learning themselves so they would have remembered who each individual was but also the events that they'd had with them you know they'd had to remember that sandra was in their group and therefore good whereas steve over there was was bad and to be avoided at all costs and i think this really highlights the the social intelligence that jackdaws can show and the and the ability of them to be able to flexibly change who they hang out with they think okay i'm going to hang out with these guys now because these guys are really good for me whereas these guys aren't giving me any 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 anything back so i'm just going to cut them out and, and and we can think of that in terms of people as well you know if you if you meet someone for the first time you have a really nice time with them or you, you go to the pub and you have a really good really good laugh you're likely to see them again and that will build and build and build and and the opposite is true too but one interesting thing we did find is that within family members within the jackdaws so within siblings within offspring and parents and within partners they weren't able to do quite as well. They were still able to move, you know, they were able to associate slightly better with these guys and slightly worse with the other guys, but, but not quite so much in the same way that, you know, if you meet someone at the pub for the first time, you, you know, you're not constrained, you can see them again and again, and that's great, or you could just kind of cut them out and never see them again. Whereas if it's an in-law or if it's, you know, a sister, you, a cousin you're not particularly fond of, you're still probably a bit constrained. You're going to catch them at family Christmas. You're still, you know, there, there's some constraints there. You're still probably going to, you're probably going to see them again, even if you didn't really succeed with them. So it seems that there are analogs to that in nature, too. And, and the jackdaws are, are slightly constrained by the by the by the other parts of their social lives, which this experiment wasn't really testing. So that's the end of that second part. And just to run through what I've talked to you about today. So uh, social learning coupled with neophobia really helps animals navigate danger. Neophobia helps them stay away and the social learning helps them learn from afar from individuals that have taken the risks themselves. And this is really the driving force that's meant that jackdaws have been, have been so prevalent in urban and human disturbed areas, not just in, in towns and cities, but in farmland across the country. Social learning enables the spread of information and is really important for conservation. And uh, just today, there was a real landmark paper in one of the top scientific journals about the importance of considering social learning and animal cultures more broadly in conservation efforts. And that is being recognized more and more and has really quite high prominence these days. And finally, that jackdaws can utilize their social intelligence to gain their own rewards. And, and it requires a bit of brain power um, to, be able to, to be able to generate those outcomes. So if anyone ever calls you a bird brain in the future, you can, you can tell them that's actually a compliment. Um, and with that, I would really like to, th to thank, I mean, there are a million people I could thank, but I've, I've managed to narrow it down to just a few. Um, Alex Thornton, who is my supervisor, he is the, the, the academic driving force behind all of this work and is in charge of the Jackdaw project. Uh, Gil McIver is our postdoc, who's been head of the field team ever since it started in 2012, and it's just an absolute board of force. Um, these guys, Becky, Mike, Emily and Vic, uh, were other postgrads with me in my time and have helped me immeasurably with all these things. Uh, Luca, Chloe, Annie and Sam are students who we've had on various projects and have been really, really helpful. And of course, my benevolent funding body, the Southwest BioDTP and, and part of BBSRC, which is funded by UKRI and the UK government. Um, and also, thank you very much, all of you, for listening to me talk about jackdaws eating cheese on a gorgeous sunny evening. So with that, if anyone has any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. And thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Josh. Excellent talk. Um, uh, particularly, yeah, I liked your part about talking about how 
it informs uh, what behavior studies like this can inform conservation work. In that case, study was really interesting. And also, really a Georgie Jackdaw impression as well. <laughs> so um, I did promise it. <laughs> so yeah, um, I was going to start with a question of my own, which is what we usually do. But actually, we've already had quite a few come through. So um, I'll get straight into those. And as I mentioned before, please do pop your questions in the chat if you'd like to ask a question yourself by unmuting. Just let just pop a comment in there saying that you'd like to do that, and I'll I'll come to you there. So um, just going through the comments so far. Uh, so I agree with with Sophie who said she'd happily eat cheese to save a species in Hawaii. And doesn't need much to be convinced on that. Yeah, <laughs> much in the same boat. Uh, but yeah, let's get let's get straight to um, Roger Roger Wenak, um, one of our one of our regulars. Uh, how do you um, choose the sites that you study, uh, and what's the logic or reasoning? for particular locations? Yeah, thanks Roger. Yeah, it's a really, really good question. So our, our sites are the sort of the, the, the environmental and then, and then the practical, I'd say. So on the environmental side, we'll always look for places that jackdaws are likely to be already. Um, so when we put up our nest boxes, so instance, we put up a few at Ennis, so I think 18 at Ennis this year. So we're looking for areas where there might be jackdaws already. So some sort of mixed open grassland and woodland um because it's really easy it's much easier to kind of recruit them to the colony um they really like they as they are so social they're kind of colonial breeders in that regard so if we can find a site where there's already some jackdaws around um it's good it's just an easy in for us um and the second part of that is is this kind of social factor so finding benevolent landowners who are willing to have us just traipsing around their land putting up jackdaw boxes kind of just being a general general presence um and we're really really lucky with that um, and a massive shout out to uh, the Glorious family and Stidians and who have just been absolutely amazing and have allowed us to basically partly live on their farm for the last eight years. Um, but we're always looking, always looking for expansions. Um, so if anyone, if anyone knows of any, any places that have, that have a mixed sort of woodland and grass and especially where there's sort of cattle or sheep grazing, jackdaws love to hang around with cows or deer. Um, those are always the areas we look for. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, following straight on from that, actually, there's another another question from uh, from uh, Roger uh, is uh, is something I was going to chat talk about actually as well. So where you were talking about um, new cheeses being introduced, blue cheeses, green cheeses, all these different cheeses, yeah. and there's all this the social learning going on. And I was quite interested to find out more about. You mentioned that being aggressive is very good for that. It seems um, to be, yeah, and. Yeah, I wanted to sort of find out how, how obvious it is to find out which, which individuals go uh, follow particular personality traits. And Roger's question here is, yeah, can you follow individual birds to, to tell if boldness shows um, in many areas of behaviour, like do they become natural leaders or is it just more of an aggression thing? So what we measured here was was purely aggression. So when we, we filmed within those boxes, it was any time a bird basically directed aggression, be that um, they do some quite interesting posturing or full on full blown sort of pecs or they sometimes actually go to full on sort of mid-air squabbles um so in that regard it was only it was only aggression and there are studies in the so there's a whole field of biology around animal personality which i kind of dabble on the periphery of from time to time so i'm definitely no authority in that regard um and there but i think there are definite links between certain aggressive tendencies and certain individuals to be bold in in, in certain species um and i i would i would i would assume it would be from my anecdotal evidence of which birds come and give me a hard time and which birds were aggressive in the study would say it's reasonably similar um whether that transitions into them being socially isolated from other individuals because they they are just being aggressive to them all the time that one, one of the things we predicted actually is that aggressive birds would be really bad learners because they would have no information because other individuals would avoid them um and i i do think that still might be the case in certain aspects i think in this experiment because of just the nature of it with the food. If you are aggressive to another individual and they kind of turn around in panic with a mouthful of this big blue cheese, it's quite an obvious stimulus, right? It's quite easy to see. Um, whereas if if it was a, a puzzle, you know, what we call like an extractive foraging problem where they have to manipulate something in some way, open a little puzzle box or whatever, which requires just kind of attention, the birds that were aggressive probably wouldn't have the the restraint to, to just sit and watch and they'd, they'd barrel on in and, and clear everyone else out and would probably never learn. So I think there's definitely some sort of what we call like a mechanistic characteristic to that as well. But um, our birds definitely all do have um, personality and do have very repeatable behaviours. It's just very difficult to characterise often in, in, in ways that make sense. 
That's great, thank you. Yeah, it's um, interesting. Has, has anyone in the group ever sort of tried to do a personality study? Yeah, so uh, not in not in the explicit study of that. So like one of his PhD students looked at lots of um, like repeatability and behaviours and found that there are, so in lots of experiments we've done, the problem with studying these birds often is that they are so variable and within the population responses to the same thing will be, you know, one to a hundred. The birds do seem to respond similarly within that range over time. So there are, and, and even in this experiment, so in those boxes I showed you earlier, there are some birds that just have exactly the same habits as well. There are some that would land on the roof first, peer over the top, check everything was all right, down the side, in the go. And then others that would just come flying straight in and land in the tray with the food. And, you know, they all, and they just do that so repeatedly, you kind of just get used to the patterns of behavior. So um, I'd be absolutely gobsmacked if there isn't some some underlying repeatable personalities in that excellent thank you uh, moving on to the next one we've had quite a few coming thank you all for your, for your questions so far this has been great so um to what extent um may jackdaws be regarded as an indicator species in terms of environmental and or climate change um, for example uh, will jackdaws utilize social learning as a means of changing habits uh, habitats as a result of environmental slash climate change is that something you've come across yeah, so that's a cracking question. Yeah, so jackdaws, the, the second part, yes, jackdaws will definitely, the, the social learning I think is part of, is, is one of the large parts of why they have been really successful in, in urban environments and why they're able to sort of handle all the pressures of, 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 of sort of being around people and, and people's products. Um, in terms of in terms of their just kind of general biology, they are reasonably generalist. They are in in the sense that they are not super specialised on a particular food source. They will they will move from grains to seeds to insects to whatever they can really get their hands on. They're not super fussy, um, and they seem to be reasonably tolerant. You know, the jackdaw. If you look at the the population maps of the habitats they live in across, you know, you've got jackdaws that live in Israel where it's much hotter, much drier. And sort of not there is a, a big study of them in Spain. Um, we're in the and they go much much higher up in the range where it's much colder than it is. I reckon Cornwall is actually a pretty pretty cushy place for a jackdaw to live. Um, so I don't know how much they'd be useful as an indicator. I reckon they're probably more robust than the majority of species. So they definitely wouldn't be the canary the first to go uh, in that regard. I wouldn't think. But yeah, they they they're definitely able to to uh, to cope with a lot more um, a lot more different problems than 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 many species are. I think. Yeah, they're good, uh, hardy species, as it were. But um, yeah, excellent. Uh, uh, question here from David, um, who really said a lot to talk. You should, if you haven't, Josh, you should go through and read some of the comments. There's lots oh, of nice ones as well around the questions. Um, but yeah, I uh, really like the picture you showed briefly um, with the hundreds of different jackdaw photos overlaid, creating those sort of lines going through the, yeah. uh, the sky. Um, and it feels like, um, David says he feels like he's seen something like that in a sort of science art. And is that something you're aware of or have ever been involved in? Yeah, so if anyone's, it, there's a competition called the Art of Science, um, which is like a, it's, it's just fantastic. The stuff people are able to do with some of its micro, microscope work, some of its telescope work, some of it, you know, it's just basically, it's, I, th I think the criteria is it has to be science first, art second, but something that looks really beautiful. And I've, I've, so those photos are things made by Gil, who's our postdoc, and I've, I've definitely pestered him too. I mean, I think he has a couple framed in his house at the moment, and they are, there are so many of them, and they're just mesmerizing to look at. So that's definitely, definitely something we should really consider submitting to. Um, yeah, and they are really, really beautiful images. Yeah, absolutely. I know in the future, um, as the Cornwall Science Community, we're hoping to do some festivals when we can do festivals again, which. Nice to combine science, art, culture, all different things yeah. there. So we might be coming knocking on the door there. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. The conversation thing, show something. Um, next question here. Do, do you know which factors the jackdaws base their recognition on others off? Um, or are there, uh, uh, sorry, or are there other individuals as obviously recognisable as we are to each other as humans? Yeah, that's a, that's a cracking question. And the, the short answer is, I don't know. Um, this there's no studies that have really looked into it and the long answer is probably a mixture of um I, i'm sure there's an, a vocal component in there an auditory component they they each you know they each make all these vocalizations and they'll be chatting to their partners constantly and i'll be shocked if they if they don't um are able to differentiate by that and on that call alone because especially when they're flying around they do lots of contact calling and just kind of maintain contact with each other um and 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 it's one of those funny things right and i i think about this a lot of a lot um 
to me, all the jackdaws look reasonably similar. There are some that have kind of characteristics that look a bit odd. Like one has an underbite, one's got a white feather and all that sort of stuff. But in general, I reckon, you know, in the same way that lots of animals think all people look the same, we just all think all jackdaws look the same. I don't see a reason why jackdaws to jack shouldn't look as different as people look to us. Like, I don't, I don't see a reason why that shouldn't, you know, they sh why they shouldn't be able to visually identify each other. They spend all their time looking through a jackdaw's eyes at a jackdaw world. Therefore, I, I don't see why it shouldn't be the case that they should be, you know, visually distinct to each other. Yeah, great. Has there any, I know, certainly at the university, there's, there's a lot of work that goes on in terms of um, the Martin Stevens group on like different, how different animals perceive the world and see things. Has there ever been any sort of study you've been aware of looking at how jackdaws see the world? Are they, do they see lots of colours? Are they? Is it yeah, so they are. So one of the parts of this experiment in 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 sort of this is kind of the nuts and bolts of the science in terms of getting it through. Well, what is called getting it through the review process. Lots of other scientists will shoot questions down at you and, and try and you know and quite correctly try and blow the doors off you what your work is done. And so when we did the cheese experiment, one thing we had to show is that the jackdaws were able to different. We you know we can see that blue is different from green and red and and grey. But can the jackdaws? So we don't really we don't really know um, off the top of our heads. So what we had to do is uh, there are these these toolkits available where someone has taken all the the anatomy and the and the physiology of a bird eye and basically created a, a visual toolbox which you can take a photo, put the photo through, and you can look at what it looks like through bird vision, for instance. And you create this little diagram, and you can say, oh, yes, a bird could differentiate this color from that color and this color from that color um and jackdaws yeah we so that so so that's what we know about um we could we could tell using that that they could definitely differentiate all of those colors um and on the whole they see the world probably reasonably similar to us um that it might be a bit blurrier that so there's a there's a relationship between how big an eye is and how sharp an image is it's called acuity um and just by being smaller it's the image will probably be a bit blurrier and not as not as sharp but i i, I imagine they see the world not too differently from how we see it Great. Um, that leads quite nicely into a question here. I'm, I am skipping one, but I'll come back to it. Uh, but yeah, one from, from Sophie who says, um, I always assume birds, well, I always assume that birds aren't that intelligent. Brackets don't shoot me. Um, I always thought um, it may have been that they have really good memory and remember where they can find good food. Um, so do you know if, it's a, if it is a question of intelligence or memory, or is it a combination of the two, maybe? So, so it kind of opens Pandora's box a little bit, that question, but I, I like it a lot. Um, it's something I think about a lot. So um, as for the first part, the, the intelligence part, no one in the scientific community can really agree what they mean by intelligent. There is no standard of what intelligence is, um, much to the sort of, de actually probably to the detriment of research because people argue about, you know, they say different things mean the same and the same things mean different. But um when we research it, we kind of research it in terms of in terms of cognition and what and the experiment we ran there is what I call sort of a social cognition experiment. So within their social lives, they're solving a social problem. Um, and the, and the, the stuff about remembering, remembering where they find food comes down to a sort of uh, what would be called spatial cognition and Corvids especially are some of the best, you know, we think about um, individuals that you think about hiding and caching food so jays and especially the jays in the americas like the scrub jays are incredibly good they can remember where two thousand three thousand four thousand acorns and nuts and stuff are hidden in one year and if they think someone else has watched them hide something they'll pretend to hide it and then go and hide it somewhere else instead and there are all these fascinating things about how they how they try and protect their protect their food i think in general so it to, to sum up in a, in, a, in a way that doesn't end up me talking about this for hours, there are definitely things that animals can do and things that animals are adapted to that will be very specialist. So for instance, remembering exactly where I stored my acorns and there'll be things that are kind of general. So um, being able to just kind of solve lots of associative problem, learning you know associations between lots of things that might help me more generally. And so there's lots of debate in, in animal research whether you know cognition and intelligence is, is kind of modular and specific. You know you evolve that one to deal with that problem and that one to deal with that problem, or whether you kind of just evolve this kind of general ability, which is probably more akin to what people would call in intelligence. Um, and and the corvids themselves are probably one of the one of the best examples of this. So the way it's often measured is the size of your brain relative to the size of your body is a good reasonably good predictor of like how much brain power you have and corvids are on exactly are pretty much exactly the same on that ratio as great apes and the smart cetaceans like dolphins so in that regard they're doing pretty pretty darn well 
Um, so I hope that hasn't, uh, well, maybe it's given you a thousand more questions, but I hope that's uh, at least solved, solved some of it. Well, a thousand more questions is what we have Cafe Sci for. So, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. feel free to ask away. Um, there's a question here. I think um, someone's inter uh, connection dropped out in the middle of the talk, but just to, just to make sure I've got the info right here. With the A's and the B's, um, when they were selected, that was done randomly, was that by? Yeah, yeah. so the, the specific was, was what's called kind of pseudo random. So we, we randomly did it with some conditions. So we basically, we set up some conditions and we said, there'll be the same number of adults in both groups. There'll be the same number of males and females in both groups. And we did it so that all of our, we had a list of all of our, all of our pairs um, for our nest boxes and we split it so that um, half of the pairs were within the same group whether they were within A or within B and half of the pairs were split so they were a cross group so they were one was an A and one was a B and that way we kind of had a representative sample which pairs those were was was done just by random number generation but the and, and the same is to be said of we basically took all of our individuals that are relate related via either being a sibling or a parent offspring and, and did the, and did the same thing so we had kind of a, a balanced sample but it was randomly decided from there great and that leads into there's a, there's a couple of different questions kind of addressing this issue in terms of it's quite a divisive experiment um trying to make them identify as right this jackdaw is my friend and uh yeah. we both get good food if i'm with them and not with the others yeah were did we able to look at any sort of after the experiment finished was there any kind of long-term effects did you did you see any like things go back to normal or so we had, whilst we were running this experiment, we can't, can't we monitor the, like the social structure loosely of the population constantly. We have these, the feeders that are just kind of indiscriminate at our sites and that they just read who the birds are. And basically we can get a, a general picture of who's hanging out with who at any one time. Um, and so we ran that kind of concurrently through our experiment and we found a very, so we found a good effect at the actual feeders that were doing the differentiating. And, and at, at the same time, our feeders that were, you know, on the other side of the fields and running at different times within the day, we found a very weak effect that there did seem to be a carryover that the birds that would assort together and hang out together were sort of hanging out together a bit, but the, the actual size of that effect was quite small. My intuition is that for birds, and, and as, as we said with the kind of affiliation stuff and about, you know, the individuals that were already had a relationship were less able to sort of change their relationship. The, the, the size of the reward and especially the size of the sort of punishment, if you will, just not being able to access mealworms in the grand scheme of a jackdaw's life probably wasn't that meaningful. So we were able to modify them to, to see if they could do it and they were able to do it at the, at the time at the experiment. But I, I think the rest of the, the rest of the factors that influence their life were probably far more fundamental in, in shaping their interactions. And especially for instance, for individuals that already had prior interactions and prior histories. It, it may have meant that a couple of individuals that were kind of peripheral to each other before and all of a sudden were in the same group and succeeded a few times, they may have hung around a bit more going forward and vice versa. But I, I don't think it would have had any lasting impact on the social structure of the population. Great. Um, I was about to say that's all the questions we've had so far, but we've had one more just pop up now. So, um, so yeah, this is a, yeah, thank you for the very nice talk. I'm currently... Um, developing my own PhD thesis on jackdaws and behavior. So I enjoyed it very much. There you go. Uh, both very cool experiments. Did you perform them during the breeding season? Um, and if so, always maybe pre-breeding pre season, post-breeding season. And do you think it could, could give diff, do you think it could give different results um, in terms of motivation, for instance? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So our birds, um, the kind of we have a, a sort of annual cycle of when we can run experiments so we only really run experiments around the breeding season just because of i don't know if this is a cornwall specific trait or if this is a wider trait but our our population so they always will be around roughly at the site but once the sort of breeding season so they're currently on eggs at the moment and so from say a month ago until the end of july they're far more likely to accept and 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 uh, seek out food resources from people so we can sort of you know um, give them experimental experimentally supplemental food and it kind of draws them in whereas during the autumn and winter months they're far just because I think Cornwall is quite a benign place for a jackdaw to live they're just far less bothered like they 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 forage for a little bit in the morning and spend a lot of the afternoons kind of hanging around playing around on the wind you know just chatting to each other sitting on roofs and annoying pigeons 
Um, so they don't really, it's quite hard to get good data outside of the breeding season just because they aren't really motivated by food. So they don't really have to interact with us. Um, so these experiments I ran, the first one I ran all the way through the breeding season, but the majority of the data, as you can see when that graph kind of took off, that was sort of June, July. So the right at the back end, once breeding is finished, chicks have fledged and the chicks from that year were kind of put into the experiment too. Uh, and similarly with the cheese experiment last year, I was because of the pandemic we were kind of grounded until the end of may and then from june into july around those experiments so june and july are like our best months chicks have fledged they're kind of with their parents sort of and they kind of lose their dependency on their parents around that time so that's when the population is largest and everyone's just invested in reproduction so everyone's really quite worn down everyone's motivated to to solve puzzles for food etc so i think that's our our sort of best time once august rolls around especially the middle of august the harvest starts in Cornwall and therefore the birds just disappear. They, we just lose them for immediately. Like middle of August, it just goes silent in our sites. They're basically following around, following around the harvesters, picking up all the scraps for a couple of months and they don't want a thing to do with us. Great. Which is sad because I love <laughs> them, but they don't love me back. But you're, get over it. You're, you're the guy with the long hair and the mustache that comes and creeps around their nests. And all that, that is stuff, yeah, so. that's, that's yeah. a sad realization really, isn't it? <laughs> Um, but a wave of more, more comments coming in. So thank you. Yeah, no for those. Um, so, are the populations at your study sites changing, or have you noticed that at all? And perhaps, you know, supplementary feeding from the experiments making some kind of difference there? So, um, the populations, I think, do change over time. Um, what we've, uh, I think we've noticed over time, the birds are just getting more used to us and are, are, less, are less sensitive to our disturbance. So we've had some birds in our nest boxes now for, for the entirety of the project, which is pretty good going for jackdaws. I think I was talking to Gil about this yesterday. There are two boxes that have birds from 2012 still in them. And when the average life expectancy for a jackdaw is six, for both of the pair to still be kicking on nine, eight, nine years later is pretty good. Um, and, and they're definitely a bit bolder around us. They still, you know, give us a right earful but they they kind of learn our patterns and stuff so that's they're changing in that regard the supplementary feeding given the sizes of the populations in the local areas you know we we have in our nest box populations about 160 birds which then give rise to about 160 chicks a year plus all the other birds that are just in the area but don't nest in our boxes so nest in trees in roofs in in barns and everything and the amount of food we put out is is enough to entice them in to do experiments but i don't think is enough that any one bird can really get a dependency or um use it as a as a as a regular supplementary food source that, that's good enough to really make a, a population level difference there may be one or two birds that just kind of love a bird feeder um but i don't think there's a we don't put out enough food that that that, that really um sort of bolsters the population as a whole no i think at that at that point we also scope whilst that's also both an ethical concern in terms of just like we just fill in the world with jackdaws that also just brings up a lot of scientific issues regarding you know the birds are the birds are dependent on us and therefore they will behave differently and, and our results become far less clear at that point yeah that's good to know um just sort of, sort of building that I, I guess slightly is um got a question you're asking is there a migratory aspect to the cornish jackdaws or are they here the whole time yeah, so no, they, they are here the whole time. They are incredibly set, even in the winter. Um, so in the summers, they hang around their breeding. Their, their, their behavior in the year does change. Um, so in the summer, they'll stay in the, they, they kind of roost in the trees above the nest box. Sometimes they'll actually roost in their nest box itself. But it kind of, you know, when I found out that they don't always sleep in their box, it, you know, I think we think about humans and beds and bedrooms and the birds definitely don't think of it like that. That's just where they lay their eggs and they're far happier to set up in a tree than most of the time. Um, once the autumn and winter starts rolling around, their behavior changes and they, they start roosting away from where their nest site is and they form these big communal roosts. So the ones our birds from Stidians go to is up over Lanaway, up at, um, is it Scoria House? Um, on the, basically by the Fox and Hounds pub. There's a big, yeah. big house um, up, in the, up in the grounds around there. Um, and that will draw anywhere from hundreds to a few thousand birds a night. Um, but then they wake up in the morning and the first thing they do, they'll ping straight back over to Stidians and make sure no one else has nicked their box. Um, so they are very, very, very tied to the local area and you, you'll see them in the area all year round. Um, Disper again, and, and even with dispersal, we're not really sure where they go when the what. So when we have chicks that leave our boxes and, and, and disappear, we never see them again. We're not sure if some, obviously some will die. There's not... Um, there's not good not amazing survival there's not full survival we're not exactly sure what the rate of the rate of survival is but we have birds sometimes i think we've had one bird turn up at loo we had one bird turn up 
um, up towards Bodmin Way, but not very. You know, that's the absolute extremes of where they go. So, so compared to a lot of birds, they don't they don't seem to move that far. Yeah, that's good to know. Um, okay, yeah, a few more questions have rolled in. Ro coming back to the A's and B's experiment, um, and mm -hmm. building on what we've sort of spoken about since uh, in the other questions. So if, if behavior didn't change uh, much at other bird feeders outside the experiment, um, where there's, you know, you weren't gonna get an advantage of teaming up with various people. Um, yeah. Does that mean that these birds can um, recognize behavior that is situation dependent um, outside of say, you know, um, yeah, like, um, is it the case that they, they know when they're at those bird feeders? Yeah, yeah. But everywhere else I, it's fine. Yeah, I, th I think that is, that's a really good point. And I think that is probably likely to be the case in this instance. So the kind of, the idea behind this experiment was to, to test if they can learn these associations. So imagine if this was two birds that had to cooperate to, to solve problems in the real world and they might want to hang out more together because they cooperate well together. Um, obviously we're kind of constrained as to what we can actually experiment with. So the bird feeders kind of have to be there and then. Um, but yeah, for sure. And I think this is probably, it could just be simply learned by, you know, when they're there, they have a memory that, you know, when they're with that bird, they get food, but when they're at the other feeders that it doesn't, they get food, whatever happens, there's no, there's no association with any other birds that kind of exists over there. So they're happy to just turn up with, with whoever. Um, I suppose if we were to implement a system where the, where the costs and benefits were much, much more, much greater or more severe, I think that could, that could end up with the population being kind of more constrained to, to staying within those, within those A's and B's in those sort of small clusters in sort of a wider, a wider range of context because it becomes a lot more salient and meaningful. But I think, yeah, in, in, in this experiment, they definitely probably just stayed, stayed where they were um, at those contexts. That's impressive that they can differentiate that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the feeders look reasonably similar it's just a big big tube of grain but yeah no they uh, they got it going on <laughs> so if these experiments um, with cheese were done with a different bird species do you think you get similar results obviously a lot of different species there um or you know is this something that's more specific to jack jackdaws um with their intelligence um so i, I guess and there's also a follow-up here in terms of you know do you think with cor other corvids, it would be similar. And then, you know, if you did the same with sparrows, what would happen? Yeah. Um, so I, there's, there's two things here, I suppose. I think jackdaws are, are really, really are pretty smart. But at the same time, there's nothing inherently intelligent about social learning. So we've, uh, science has in, in the last, it started with quite smart species and was thought to be this, you know, this cult, so social learning forms, cultures, chimpanzees using tools and all this sort of stuff. But in the last few years, you know, there's, there's lots of studies that show that animals that we think of as pretty simple can, can learn from watching each other. And even, even there's, there's experiments that have showed that animals that are solitary for their pretty much entire lives, like tortoises can utilize social learning despite never really needing to. Um, and, and there's lots of philosophical arguments about whether there's anything actually social about it at all or whether it's just, you know, an object moving another object. But um, I think you'd it, the, the dependency of, of the result you'd find, I think, would depend on how bold other individuals are and how other species would take risks. So if individuals would try and learn themselves more readily um, and you wouldn't see as much social learning if they're just willing to willing to try lots of stuff. I mean, lots of it, lots of species do show uh, food neophobia specifically. I think it's quite a, a widespread thing within the animal kingdom that eating stuff that you don't know what it is, is, is a pretty good way to end up dead and therefore is something that's probably best avoided and therefore isn't definitely not restricted to jackdaws. Um, our results about the, some of the demographic processes like um, age and the, the age result, for instance, is probably reasonably widespread and representative. That, that, that seems pretty, pretty in line with lots, of, um, with lots of theory about just kind of learning in general. And in many species, adults are, are likely to be more knowledgeable. Um, but there is an interesting caveat to that and an interesting kind of thought experiment that, that is still unresolved in that in many, many species, um, adults are always thought of as knowledgeable. And there are many species where you can look at um, biases where, where young learn from old. But there are also species in where young individuals are actually more innovative and come up with solutions to problems more readily than adults. And so you've got this kind of odd paradox by where young individuals can come up with novel solutions to problems that then don't get transmitted to the rest of the population because they're young individuals and not really paid attention to. And I think there was one in, there was a, a population of capuchin monkeys somewhere in somewhere in South America where there was a, a, 
an individual, a, a juvenile that came up with a brand new technique of opening this new type of nut. And, and it had been doing it for years, but no one actually ever started paying attention until it became an adult and became quite dominant within the group, at which point it then spread through all the members of the group who were below it. Um, and it then spread, but it took until it had gained this status for other individuals to really pay attention to what it was doing. So there's, there's, there's a lot to be learned and a lot to be explored about how these, how these things interact in it. And it's something I'm hoping to, hoping to be able to get out this year a bit with some experiments we're, we're planning on running. Can you tell us anything about those experiments, or are they hushed? Yeah. So I basically, yeah, well, so it's one thing to be able to learn based on fixed patterns. You know, animals can have ingrained patterns, like you know, my I'm predisposed rigid fixed pattern to learn from old individuals and nothing else matters whereas in a changing world where information changes there's a quite a good analog here to you know in humans old people are more knowledgeable older people have learned more and all of a sudden new technology comes along and everyone everyone's looking to their grandkids to work out how to work out that phone and, it, and it's that kind of switch of being able to be flexible that allows you to be able to make the best of that situation so i want to test whether if all of a sudden we're going to simulate using using similar experiments with similar feeders that all of a sudden juveniles the young individuals are knowledgeable and they have they have the access and older individuals have to follow them to be able to gain that access and can they just are they flexible enough in their behavior to be able to say okay this is the strategy that's now successful for whatever reason these guys are good and we're going to follow them or is it as rigid as they're young we're old we're not going to really pay attention regardless of the fact that it would be beneficial and 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 i think that flexibility is is often the thing that is is talked about in terms of intelligence a bit more having the bandwidth to be able to assess alter come up with new strategies that aren't just kind of ingrained in and, and fixed in great well it'll be interesting to see what comes of that yeah maybe we'll have you back to another follow-up talk at some point oh, that'd be grand. um so a couple more questions that have, that have come through um so the study itself could be considered to be sort of almost messing with birds heads a little bit is there <laughs> any kind of ethical approval well i know that you do go through ethical approvals but does, does that element of it come in to those approvals yeah so one of the things so um one of the things we have to do for every experiment we have to submit a full ethical approval which goes through a review board of academics at the university and there's a whole set of guidelines that the association for the study of animal behavior have um that you have to you have to follow um and so one of the things we had on ethical approval was you know, is this going to cause antagonism between birds? Are these birds going to, you know, are you going to be disrupting relationships? Are you going to be really affecting the birds? And, and obviously with experiments like this, the answer when you're going in is I don't really know. I, I can't know now, otherwise, why would I be doing the experiment? Because I would have the answers already. So you have to use your best guess. And I suppose what, what we put on the application is we don't think so, but we will monitor it. And if we see evidence that this is happening, if we, you know, if we see that pairs that are split out, so, you know, across things are really struggling to raise offspring or they're, you know, they're fighting more or whatever. At that point, we then, we then, we pull the plug. Um, we have, we have a set level of, of, of um, alteration that is acceptable in order to learn things. And then above that, that is not justifiable. The, you know, the, the ends don't justify the means. Um, and, and in this sort of experiment, that's, 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 you know, that's what we did in that regard. Yeah, it's quite a thorough process, isn't it? Getting getting that through. So, yeah, yeah. always good to know that, that these things have gone through gone through those processes. Yeah, yeah, it's all all well above board. Yeah. Um, so um, at the moment, this might be the last question. If you've got any more, please do add them in. Otherwise, I've got this one and then one for myself. But um, uh, do corvids learn from from? Or sorry, do other corvids learn from the jackdaw? I.e., do you lose some of the grain to to magpies, for example? Um, I don't have any direct evidence that happens. So one of the things that we get, we get a lot of rooks at our study sites and a few crows. Um, so I don't see any reason why corvids shouldn't be able to learn from each other as easy as they can from their own species. There may be something um, hardwired into their heads that means they just kind of pay attention less to other species because they are just less you know, useful in, in general, um, which may restrict the information they get. Um, but I, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be able to, to, to learn from similar species. Um, so one thing we find, so the, the, one of the ways we ring these birds is we use what's called a ladder trap. So it's basically a big mesh, about two by three meter, one and a half meter high kind of pen, which has a ladder on the top and the birds kind of drop through into it to get food. Um, and they're kind of really social, socially facilitated like that. So if you cat, if you know, if there's one, if the trap is empty, the birds are kind of wary of it. As soon as one bird goes in, it doesn't matter if it's, a jackdaw, a rook, a crow, one black bird is in there and everyone's happy and everyone piles on in. 
Um, and, and that's the same. And magpies are drawn to that. There's just kind of a social attraction there. So there's definitely, and, and because they share reasonably similar habitats, you know, they are, they're obviously differentiated in their, in their, what they eat and, and, and their ecology in general, but they are more similar to each other than they are to other birds, for instance. I, I would be shocked if they weren't able to, to observe what each other are doing and, and, and gain information that way. I suppose it's just maybe the opportunity is less across species. Thank you very much. I uh, have one more coming. Yeah, no worries. Um, so, the, um, yeah, it's, it's intriguing that the family relationship seems to cut across the social divides with the A's and B's that you were talking about earlier. Um, mm -hmm. So building on that, I guess, how strong um, are these family relationships um, or how, how strong they appear to be? And do you, do you, come, a, do you come across these in any other ways that it shows up? So, the again, the... The, the short answer is we don't really know. Um, in terms of the pair bond, we know a fair amount about that and that is incredibly strong. They just kind of hang around with each other constantly all the time um, and they are reliant on each other. They build the nest together. Um, the, the female brood and the male feeds her while she's brooding. They raise the chicks together, you know, they are. And then they spend, unusually for lots of birds, they spend the entire winter together as well. They are each other's closest individual. In terms of other family members, it's, it, it remains reasonably anecdotal from, you know, good observations of just seeming to notice birds with their offspring or with their siblings just kind of hanging around on roofs and in trees more than more than we might expect and be like oh why are you over here oh there's your dad over there cool you know you're not and you don't usually hang around here oh there's you know there's your your sibling there isn't a an obvious interaction between the birds you know we don't see them preening we don't see them um obviously interacting in a way that makes us think oh that's a, a defined behavior that, that families do and they and they definitely don't hang out in in real family groups in that regard but there does seem to be some recognition that there are those those individuals are, are kin and whether whether that means they're just you know are more tolerant of each other or are more likely to defend if there are predators or, or whatever we, we don't really know but that there is the possibility that there is something going on there sorry i can't give you more concrete just more things to be more studies to be done exactly there's more, always there's always more jackdaws to know about more masters and phd projects to be had um as a quick follow-up here on that it, 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 of um do adolescents have, tend to hang out with each other more than adults i guess if you like tracking question it. yeah yeah that's a really good question and actually something i have an answer to which is great so one of the preliminary things we were checking for this this experiment we were going to do this year is uh, how the population kind of roughly assorts itself and and there is an assortment so individuals that when i say assortment they kind of group by age age class so there are three what i'd call sort of biologically relevant age classes in jackdaws so you've got juveniles when they've just come out of the nest for their kind of first year you have first well second like sub adults so they're kind of at this point in the year they are one year old so their last year's offspring the majority of them don't breed in their first year usually due to a shortage of nesting sites so they kind of just bat around annoying breeding pairs really sitting on their nest boxes looking in trying to work out what's going on we think basically spend just a lot of time gathering information on where's good to breed who's doing well who's doing what just generally being pests um, but they have paired up by this point they usually pair up in i think between four and oh, i'm not gonna get the numbers wrong but within their first year um, and then adults who are two years and up um and they do seem at the feeders in anyway in our in our in our sites they do seem to hang out with individuals that are like more likely their age than than, than not which which kind of which kind of makes sense because they have the same kind of functional stuff going on at the time um yeah so yeah they, they they do seem to so so these juveniles will hang out with their parents a lot once they're fledged um because they get fed by them and then they kind of their parents are trying to stop feeding them and the juveniles will just follow them around begging for ages um, and then the adolescents, um, the sort of first year birds, say, sub adults will, will often hang around, in, in, seem to hang around together anyway. Makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> common, yes, so like us, yeah, very much so. Yeah, I was oh, seeing a lot of parallels there. Yeah. Um, so I guess the, the question I, I've been wanting to ask um, was well it's more less of a question more of i'd like you to paint, paint a picture for us of how you go about creating all these different cheeses in your kitchen oh and, the, wow. uh, and how much of a mess does it create my, house, my housemate luke loves telling this story it's a shame he's not here because i'm sure he'd delight in telling you all how he'd come into the come into the kitchen at sort of 6 a.m bleary eyed in the summer morning and i'm just there in a pair of pair of like football shorts just stirring my pot of blue cheese but um so what you have to do is you take 
so that it's a it's a right method and i learned it off alison she she skyped me from hawaii to teach me how to do this um so what you do is you take a block of cheddar first thing you want to do is you want to cube it you want to cut it up small big blocks don't melt very easily and kind of get the edges get melt then they start to catch and burn the middle still rock solid so you want to you know get a nice big pan low really low heat and the trick is to melt it till it's almost like gloopy and plasmary but it's not a liquid once it's liquid you, you've kind of lost that has to go out and then you can tip in your dye you measure out your dye so you know however many caps of dye and just kind of stir it in while it's still pretty gloopy um get it nice and even fold it in fold it in fold it in get splashed by hot cheese dye it hurts you know it ruins clothes but you get your cheese shirt on I should have said that one there is a cheese dyeing shirt and it's covered in different colored splats um and then let it cool pop it on a chopping board let it kind of smooth itself out or put it in a tupperware even better because then it has a bit of shape to it and then then you can cut it up into nice little cubes and then you can feed it to feed it to your birds easy peasy for yourself if you want to have jack i, or I did try them all i'd like to put the you know i wouldn't i wouldn't put any, my jacks through anything i wouldn't put myself through and they tasted fine tasted pretty much the same to me a lot of effort for something that tastes the same um Although we were we were talking this year of trying to work out, you know, if on, on a whim, you know, if the Jaxels preferred Yarg to, to regular cheddar, see if we can get a piece, you know, regular, if a bit of good Cornish cheese might might be preferred. Can really see sort of a, you know, Daily Mail headline or, you know, definitely Falmouth packet worthy at least. But <laughs> that's, for a, that's for another day. Yeah, um, has it always just been cheddar? Has there ever been any branching out into other cheese? Um, I, th I think they, I think in about 2017 there was some red Leicester around knocking around. I think I've I think I've seen videos of some distinctly orange cheese on a on a feeding table once, but no, it's always it's always been budget cheddar for me. Um, so but, there's one the, the the cheese board the cheese yeah, board. I, I guess that would be probably put too much of an overload with given how much they don't like change. Yeah, yeah, no, that who knows, who knows, who knows if they see each other, who knows. I see Roger said tried chili. I mean, we actually did put chili in some of our food ones because so jackdaws and and, and birds don't really have the receptor for for spice in the way that mammals and, and people do. So we lose a lot of our our grain to squirrels. I nearly said a bad word about squirrels there, and I restrained myself um, to silly squirrels, um, and they are the bane of my life because squirrels go to the feeder and they get their little paw out and they scoop of the food out and it's just piling up on the floor and then every now and again they're like oh i want that piece and they'll eat it and they'll just sit there and they'll clear out two three kilos of grain in a few minutes and eat 10 pieces of it um so we tried lacing it with a bit of, a bit of spice to try and try and wean them off it because the birds don't really taste it but we thought it would give the squirrel a bit of a, a bit of a fright but turns out the, the the squirrels of stivians like their curries hot sadly so it didn't really work and uh we've had to go on to new pastures and trying to keep them off so <laughs> Well, you, you did what you could. That's it. Uh, comment here as well. Just mentioned that the people who own Yarg are based in Stidians. So, yeah, I, um, I drive. I drive past it every time I go to my field site, so it's always on my mind. Well, I'd definitely like to hear more about, about that one if you go down that route. Yeah. Um, but that I, that I think wraps it up nicely for us. So thank you very much, Josh. What we usually do at this point, we just try and get everyone to unmute and do a do a round of applause and see if we can get that to work. Um, so um, I think, thank you all very much, and thanks yeah. for coming. I think David, if you can, um, if you can, if you should I've requested that you can't automatically do it anymore. Oh, so, right. if anyone wants to unmute themselves and join in, thank you very much, Josh. Thank you, Josh. Thank you.